myself, I begin by telling you that there are no biological effects from exposure to radio frequency radiation or extremely low frequency radiation. You'll buy that, right? Good, good. I like, try to be convincing. If I tell you that maybe there are biological effects, but they're of no health consequence whatsoever, you'll buy that, right? Oh, come on, guys, work with me. Work with me. I mean, after all, there's no known mechanism by which these fields can affect biological systems, and there's no convincing evidence whatsoever that these fields produce health effects. I'm not winning you over, right? <laughs> well, of course there are. If I were representative of industry, this is what you'd hear. This is what you read. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because of something that happened to me a long time ago. When I was in Australia to talk to folks about power lines and possible biological effects associated with exposure to ELF fields, I had followed the footsteps of an industry representative, a fellow by the name of H.B. Graves. Very smooth. Yes, you remember H.B. Very, very smooth talker. He'd been there a week or two before I got to Melbourne. And so I was very naive. I was much younger at the time. This is 25 years ago. And when I was interviewed by a radio station, one of the first questions they asked me was, good, we heard what HB had to say, and I'm listening to what you have to say. Why should we believe you? How do we know who to believe? And I figured, that's one of the best questions anybody ever asked. How do you know who to believe? On what basis do you attempt to discuss this issue with other people? So what I want to do for a little bit with you guys today is talk about a couple things. I don't want to catalog effects. I know it says I'm going to talk about DNA damage and RFR exposure. And I will tell you, yes, RFR exposure can damage DNA. There you have it. And I'll talk a little bit more about it in context in a bit. But rather than just catalog biological effects for you, that doesn't get us anywhere. It's like preaching to the choir. What I'd rather do is provide some perspective for you so that the question of who do you believe takes on a slightly different meaning. Now, what I want to do, depending, I'll try and get this done in the 20 minutes, I want to discuss a couple things with you. I want to discuss what certain literature refers to as contrary data. And we see a lot of this in biological systems, and in, 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 uh, in biological research. And by contrary data, what I mean is opposing views of the same subject. One paper says this happens, another paper says no, not that, this. So we have contrary data, but contrary data has to be viewed within the context of existing science. So I want to talk a little bit about that with you. Plus, there's one other thing that I think turns out to be important. I know we have people here who have to deal with regulatory issues, with policy issues. And so the whole issue of weight of evidence is something you're going to hear about. Most people don't know what it means. Most people have a good reason for not knowing what it means. And even when you think you know what it means, you don't. And often, it's a misused term. So I want to spend a little time talking to you about that. So contrary data. By contrary data, what I really mean is data that is opposed to current scientific beliefs. Let's put it in that context first. If it's context, uh, contrary to long-held hypotheses, we have data that doesn't fit into what us, some people will describe as mainstream science. So what you'll hear about the work that many of us have done is that, no, it's not mainstream science. It doesn't fit in the context of what is acceptable in terms of current scientific hypotheses. All I can say there is, well, no, that's nonsense. But you have to look at why that's the case. If you look at what we know about electromagnetic fields, a couple things stand out. One is they're not like chemicals. You can go to the shelf in a laboratory that has chemicals, and you can look at a chemical, you can touch the chemical, you can feel the chemical, you can weigh the chemical, you can taste the chemical, maybe. You can smell the chemical. 
you can develop easy assays for it. If the chemical is introduced into biological system, you can often find residues associated with that chemical. You know where it's been. Not so with electromagnetic fields, not so with radio frequency radiation. So we don't have a number of these very comforting physical characteristics associated with electromagnetic fields that we have associated with chemicals. And this puts a lot of people out of their comfort zone. But it makes it easy for certain people to issue certain arguments. Now, one of the things that holds the area of electromagnetic field study back is that we still don't have any concept whatsoever as to what constitutes dose. No concept. Zero, folks. When you're talking about exposure limits here, exposure limits to whatever, milligauss, what does that mean? Does that mean for a minute, for two minutes, for an hour, for three hours, for a week? Is it okay to be exposed to that field for 15 minutes a day, for 30 minutes a day, for how many days a week, for how many weeks a year? Nobody knows because nobody knows what constitutes dose. We can't measure well enough and we don't have those same comforting physical characteristics that we do with chemicals. So we can't look at an amount per weight over time as we would with chemicals. And it makes regulating in this area, it makes acceptance of the work that's done in this area much more difficult. Now this leads to another thing, and one is, if, if you look at the papers that some of us write when we describe the work that we do in the laboratory, there's a great deal of effort that goes into describing the equipment that we use to generate magnetic fields or generate radio frequency radiation or measure. This is complicated equipment. I'm not an engineer. I work with engineers who design this equipment, who make the measurements for me. These techniques are outside the realm of normal experience of most scientists. And a lot of the criticism that is leveled at people in this area that come from groups like the American Medical Association, from the American Cancer Society, come from scientists that don't have a clue as to what a magnetic field is. They couldn't define it for you if their life depended on it, and yet they'll be the first people to tell you that there's no biological effects associated with exposure to these things they can't define. <laughs> 